WNTN Radio Boston. Welcome back to Italy Echo, the only bilingual show in the greater Boston area. Today, my guest is a PhD, Ryan Casso, founder of the Wantok Path, which fuses remote indigenous perspective with contemporary science and psychology for an alternative approach to deep contentment and happiness. He is the author of the forthcoming book, Wild Happy, and he is available to speak on the pursuit of happiness amid the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. Welcome to Italy Eco, Ryan Casso. Oh, thank you so much, Viviana. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. So you went to Papua New Guinea for a specific purpose, and yet you left Papua New Guinea with an entirely different perspective. Explain to our listeners what you discovered. Uh, so uh, when I went to Papua New Guinea, I was uh, pursuing a, a research project. And so this was very different than a lot of the other travel I had done in my life, backpacking, being a tourist, you know, just, just kind of vacationing and exploring the world. But now I went and I had this purpose. I had to get work done. I was there to collect plants that were potentially used as medicines. And so to do that, I wanted to get as far away from the hospitals and, and go into the wilderness as much as I could. So I found these remote villages. And in living amongst the people, it was a frustrating experience until I sort of crossed over and realized, you know, getting them to come to my way of thinking and trying to get work done and, you know, our, our American productivity and moving forward, you know, this was not going to work. I was going to have to adapt to them. I could not do this without them. And then doing that and letting go, I started to see that they actually had this way of life where their lives were full of happiness and contentment and simplicity. And when I reflected back on how we were living in the U.S. and how busy and crazy um, and, and sort of success driven we all were, I started to realize maybe we were missing something. Right. And what assumptions did you make beforehand about the villagers there? So it's really funny and it, and it seems so naive in hindsight, but I went there thinking, no big deal. I'm just going to go and it's a different place, but we're just going to get work done. And there's a lot of people there and, and I'll be kind and nice and it really wouldn't be that big of a deal. But culture shock is real. You know, <laughs> different cultures, they live very differently and you have to adapt because you're dealing with an entire culture. So I assume that that they were sort of wallpaper, you know, that they were the background, that they were just, you know, pawns amongst this game and they would be there and I wouldn't really disrupt them much and they wouldn't really disrupt me, me much. However, what I found was that I was completely reliant on them. I needed them for everything, for survival, uh, both physically, but also, you know, emotionally, psychologically. And so it really changed my perspective so broadly in spending that time there with them. Yeah, I am still adapting to American culture, so I can totally relate. <laughs> so could you tell us a funny story or two that you weren't able to include in the book that gives our listeners uh, more perspective on daily life over there? Right. So, you know, it's not the same in all the different areas in Papua New Guinea. And I really think that I had accidentally stumbled on this, this magical island uh, because it had a very small population in scattered villages, but in general, the world provided really nicely for them. If they were hungry, they fished. They often brought enough fish home for themselves, their family, and perhaps multiple neighbors. If they wanted fresh fruits and vegetables, they knew where to get this in the jungle. They didn't have to spend much time on working. Their concept of money and commerce and material possessions was almost non-existent. And so it was really enlightening to just spend time with them. And as I learned the language there and, and got to, to spend time with them, I realized that, that this is really where the happiness came from. It's, it's how you spend your time and who you spend your time with. It really is just time and people that lead to this deeper contentment. So, for example, one time, uh, you know, in the midst of all the culture shock, I, I would get invited as I would arrive to these villages to to dinners if they thought that I was coming and, you know, this, this foreigner and, and it was really flattering. And lots of times I had no idea what I was getting into. 
And I'm a pretty brave eater. I mean, when you're headed off to remote villages in Papua New Guinea, you kind of have to be. Um, but there was one time where it really pushed my limits. I couldn't really see what we were doing. And I went and I was just taking things, putting on my plate, trying to understand what this person's chatting to me, wasn't paying that much attention. And it wasn't until I kind of got back and there was a little kerosene lantern and I had a little light and I was trying to figure out one, I did not know what animal I was eating and two, <laughs> what part of the animal I was eating. And as I was sitting there sort of trying to half listen to these people, trying to nibble on other things, I suddenly occurred to me, I had a piece of this animal's genitalia and that's <laughs> all it was. And once that was in my head, it was very hard to move past this. But uh, as, as open-minded as, as an eater I was, um, that was not going to happen. So I, I had to sneak my way up and kind of, you know, kept it in conversation. And there was actually an opportunity where I was able to very casually um, reach into the bowl that was next to it and, and knock it back into the, the bowl of, of the animal pieces. And meanwhile, you know, just this lesson of, you know, these things happen and you just roll with it and it wasn't a big deal and, and everyone was happy. And so it, it was it was a great experience to just, you know, not get caught up in overthinking things and just just move along and, and roll with it. Thank you, Ryan, for sharing this story. Very funny. So um, since you went to Papua New Guinea uh, a few decades ago, uh, have you ever gone back or would you? And do you think now it would be much different? So it's interesting. I, I play with this in the book and I contemplate this while I'm there, because when I'm in the middle of it, I think, well, of course I'm coming back. You know, this is such a part of my life. And, and then I started to debate, well, well, what if I don't really have a reason? I mean, if I actually do get all my work done and I sort of complete those goals, then, then I don't really have a specific reason. And this is a far corner of the world. And, and sadly, I, I haven't been back. And I'm really torn. I, I now have a family of my own. And I would love to show them where so much of my growth and development came from. So much of these lessons that really have steered the contentment and decision making that I've made throughout my life, you know, where that came from and the people that it came from. I do suspect that it has probably changed a lot. I mean, I, I think about how much our world has changed and I'm sure that it has changed a lot. And so it almost makes me a little nervous that this, this magical island that I have in my head, you know, what if I go back and it's not quite as magical? So it's, uh, I'm a little torn, but I, but I do hope to get back there someday. Awesome. And tell us more about your book and when will it be released? Oh, well, uh, yeah, the, um, the book is supposed to, is, is to be released this summer uh, in about, a, uh, you know, we're hoping sometime uh, late July, early August. Uh, it'll be available pretty much everywhere books are sold. Um, it's really been a, a wild ride. Uh, it's, it's reliving, you know, COVID is this interesting time that I, I think has taken us all, it forced us all to take a little step back, kind of take a big view of life. I know with different people's jobs, some people have stopped working, other people working from home. You know, in times like this, when we're in these big transitions, uh, it's a nice time for reflection. And hopefully we come out of that with even better uh, guidance and, and perspective on what's going to drive contentment ultimately. You know, we, we get caught up in the day-to-day -day and just just going and going and going. And, and I think sometimes this, this helps. So this book was a great opportunity for me to reflect on um, actually some perspectives that I've, I've sort of accidentally been sharing with friends and family for years. And they said, you know, you should write this as a book. You know, there are all these, these stories and these anecdotes, but also just some of this perspective and reflection. And so COVID was a great time for me also to take a step back and it's about, you know, two thirds memoir of just all the adventures and honestly misadventures of everything that could have gone wrong, went wrong and, and how I was fighting to get this work done, you know, having some terrible experiences. For example, I, I ended up having malaria six times uh, in my experience in Papua New Guinea. But to this day, that first time I got malaria, yeah, if that hadn't happened, I don't I don't know if I would have been successful. I definitely wouldn't have been the person that I am because that was the epitome of me pushing and pushing and pushing and thinking I could do this by myself. The villagers told me I had malaria the day uh, that I, I was heading into the jungle one day. They said, you have malaria, you're feeling, and I thought, you know, malaria, uh, you know, I, I was from the, you know, I'm from the state of Delaware. 
the people in Delaware don't get malaria. And so <laughs> I went to the jungle anyway, I dismissed them. And then in the middle of the jungle, at some point I, I passed out and I woke up on the jungle floor. And one of my, my friends, the villager that was helping me, I woke up to him right over me and he was drawing a line on my forehead with this white chalky substance that they use. They choose betel nut with it. And I, I'm, I was caught off guard and I didn't know what was happening. And he said, oh, you know, this will this will scare away the masala. You can't sleep in the forest because the evil spirits will get you. And I was so out of it that I just went, OK. And I and I went back <laughs> to sleep thinking about how. I think sleeping on the jungle is probably not a good a good idea. All the ants, the insects, everything, the snakes, everything that's around, and I just didn't care. And that epiphany of wow, I'm I need to listen to them. They know so much more about this. I'm fighting this, thinking I can do it all on my own. And so, you know, all these types of stories and adventures, I felt like I just had to tell them in a more profound way. And so I tied them together into this story, which you know, flowed out of me pretty easily, surprisingly. And then about a third of the book is, is also this, these reflections, you know, now that it's years since, I think experiences are, are seeds that, that take a lot of time to grow. And, and we may not learn the lessons in that moment, but we reflect on them, we look back on them, and suddenly we see even the experiences we've had ourselves in a totally different light and can take away so much from that. So I'm honestly, I'm really glad I, I didn't attempt, for example, to write this book as soon as I came back because I, I would have missed a lot. But so this is why it's, uh, it's really been a, a great opportunity for me to, to share this with the world. And when it comes out this summer, I'll, I'll you know, look forward to, uh, to sharing it really on an immediate level. Terrific. That's scary and fascinating at the same time. Thank you so much, Ryan Casso, for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Viviana. It was my pleasure. Best of luck with your book. Thank you. Thank you.